Welcome everyone. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Enrique Silva, who is the Chief Program Officer at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, where he leads the development of the Institute's overall strategic program by overseeing and coordinating work plans and strategies from across the Institute's pathway to impact goal areas and global areas of work. He also leads a portfolio of projects and initiatives in Africa, co-directs the Institute's Masters in Land Policy and Sustainable Development with Spain's National University of Distance Education, and assists in the development and management of projects on land policy and urbanization in Latin America. He collaborates on the development and management of initiatives that focus on a range of themes from land-based fiscal instruments to the fiscal and land policy dimensions of large-scale urban projects to planning regimes and climate change adaptation. I've had the pleasure of knowing Enrique for many years now, and it's totally my delight to introduce him today and the rest of the panel. So I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Japonica. I have to say um, it's um, it's wonderful to be back at BU. Um, the reason Japonica and I know each other is that I once upon a time I was a planning professor here at BU and I remember when Japonica joined the sociology department and how excited I was that there was someone with her energy and her back then just the her portfolio of work um, and bringing them themes around gentrification at a time when at BU although we had wonderful uh, urban sociologists here at a time when at, at BU a city uh, a university in the middle of a city did not talk about the city uh, so I just uh, it's wonderful to see you again um, it's to, to see where you've brought the topic you literally brought it into uh, the university and obviously uh, with a huge, satisfying, huge demand. Um, so yes, Enrique Silva, the chief program officer of, uh, at the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. I suspect many of you don't know what the Lincoln Institute is. Uh, we are a private operating foundation uh, with um, our main offices are here in Cambridge on Brattle Street. If you're in Boston, please come and visit us. Uh, we've been around for about 77 years, um, and our mission is and has been for those 77 years, our mission has, is to improve the quality of life through the effective use, taxation, and stewardship of land. We research and recommend creative approaches to land as a solution to economic, social, and environmental challenges, and we do that primarily through education, trainings, publications, and events such as these, although some a little bit smaller. Um, and we um, are really um, one of those institutions and one of the reasons I love being part of it is um, we are an institution where we uh, very purposefully try to integrate theory and practice to inform public policy. Uh, it's this cross between the university and uh, an action tank and um, and hopefully you'll if you've gotten to know us it's because we've helped bridge uh, some of the theories that we're talking about with some of the policies uh, that we are trying to enact to address issues like gentrification. Um, on the topic of gentrification, the Institute's keenly aware of the ways that land policy and planning decisions can be complicit in the forced and unforced displacement of households from affordable areas of our cities. We're also keenly aware of the ways poorly designed land policies and plans or their absence can hasten and even validate the land market doctrine of the highest and best use which systematically conspires against the security of tenure and stability of low and even middle income households. Yet, if we define gentrification as a land policy and planning problem, we know that land policy and planning can also be part of that solution. Today, what we would like to do is engage in a quick but serious conversation about the concept of gentrification, the notion of displacement, and ways in which land policy and land-based financing tools have been deployed to manage development without displacement. We will do this by highlighting recent research on development patterns in Latin American cities, and as important planning and land policy decisions made when local governments have purposefully taken the threat of displacement into the, in their cities and planning projects seriously, uh, especially when there's a concern over displacement um, and, 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 and they, they see how their own public policies are generating that. I am joined today by three colleagues, two here and then another colleague, Francisco, zooming in. I, 
thank goodness for Zoom. Uh, he should be here with us, but um, he's not. <laughs> um, uh, three colleagues of the Lincoln Institute uh, that will give us a tour and a, a, a sense of what's going on in Latin America in a very positive way to think about how the Latin American context, um, both the, its cities, its urban patterns, but also its, its embrace of land policies are addressing uh, displacement um, in those cities. Well, we're joined by Francisco Sabatini, as I mentioned, um, via Zoom from Santiago, Chile. He's an urban sociologist and an expert in spatial segregation and land markets. Um, and he has a joint appointment at the University of El Bio Bio in Southern Chile and the uh, Catholic University uh, in Santiago. To my right, I have my dear colleague, Ana Claudia Rosbach, who is a social um, urban economist, a housing advocate, and an expert in informal settlements with years of experience uh, with, um, at the, in the international level on in, um, informal settlements. And more importantly, she's the director of a Latin American and Caribbean program at the Institute. And then also I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague Juan Felipe Vinilla, uh, a lawyer, uh, an urban planning and land use lawyer out of Bogota, Colombia, the principal of JFP Vinilla Associates, um, and a longtime collaborator of the Lincoln Institute. He teaches courses for us. He develops games for us. If you want to play land, re if you want to learn about land readjustment through a game, I'll give you his number. He's actually <laughs> teaching a game in my class next week. Uh, so. Um, um, and um, so we're here to really have a con conversation with my three colleagues. Um, and I'm gonna do that with two sets of questions. So we're gonna go through the three colleagues with, uh, we'll ask them each a set of questions, uh, one round and then a second round, and then hopefully we'll open it up. And the idea behind the questions is first, uh, frame a question that will allow them to contextualize the current urban moment in Latin America in their city or the cities in which they work um, and what displacement and gentrification looks like there. Francisco will frame it much uh, from a, both the, his theoretical work on the notion of uh, on the notion of the concept of gentrification as in relationship to displacement and then we'll go through the context in which uh, too soft. Wow. I've never heard that. Well, actually, no, I have. <laughs> um, my apologies. Um, and the second set of questions will be, uh, I think it's that the core of the, the presentation, what we're excited and thankful that, to have the space to share with you, actual existing policies that are pro providing results uh, uh, in places that if they had developed without these policies, there would have been displacement and we'll hear about those. So I'm gonna start with Francisco and I, I cannot, I'm gonna be a little rude. I'm not gonna see your face when I ask you, but you have, you have a significant body of work looking at the issues of social spatial segregation and the ways in which culture, class and land markets interact to create and deconstruct distinct social spatial patterns in Latin America, Chile more specifically. In your work, you make a distinction between displacement and gentrification and you take and you you make a quick note that you don't equate the two uh, often, and you definitely don't use them interchangeably. Can you talk about this distinction and how it is informed by your empirical work in Chile as well as your more recent work in Mexico? Hey, hello everybody. Thank, thank you, Enrique and uh, Boston University for this invitation. Uh, I would like to answer with this uh, image of uh, Colonia, uh, of uh, this condominium Tres Lagos in Azcapotzalco, Mexico City. That's a picture I took in 2015. Uh, this are, is a very old work, working class kind of company town, uh, kind of because uh, People own their houses. And these people are not being displaced by the condominiums that are of Tres Lagos that is in the backstage of the photo. Um, these condominiums are being built uh, in a huge in this industrial area in this uh, delegation, Azcapotzalco, in the northeast of Mexico City. Uh, this site is like 
more or less 800 hectares of uh, industrial land. Uh, Tres Lagos is a kind of a dozen uh, buildings, 21 levels, and uh, four middle classes, upper and low middle classes. And this is according to the original idea of gentrification. This is gentrification, but it's, it's not giving way to displacement. Um, the, the resident of both uh, developments of the old area and the new ones, they have some kind of conflicts. Uh, I would uh, label those conflicts as environmental conflicts. For instance, in uh, where is water, uh, these uh, tall towers have uh, built uh, in the basement a huge uh, reserve of water. They are connected to the public system. So because of gravity, they will take uh, uh, the water first and they are having conflicts about that. And any uh, many other things, uh, but uh, the, the, the feeling among the, we, we did a, a, a land, a work there with the interviews in, in that year, 2015, and, uh, and there, there was a, a different type of uh, attitudes towards the, the, gen, the gentrifiers, but uh, most of them were uh, positive. And this is related also to the fact that the 40% of the buyers of the new apartments are people born or raised in these working class settlements of the surroundings. And that makes a very, that's what we call endemic, endemic gentrification. Gentrifiers produce, produce it by the same zone. Or area. I will leave it uh, up to this part. Okay, uh, Enrique, sigo? Sigue, sigue. Sorry, that's uh, continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I usually speak too much and my English is awful at this time. Okay. Um, Ruth Glass spoke of the, in, 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 in that uh, text, in, in which uh, she names for the first time gentrification. So he, uh, she was saying that the uh, working class quarters of London have been invaded by the middle classes, upper and lower. And then she says, once this process of gentrif gentrification starts in the district, it goes on rapidly until all or most of the original working class occupiers are displaced and the whole social character of the district is changed. Okay, this speaks of a, of a very dynamic uh, process where you have uh, this, this phenomenon, this gentrification that is in essence urban development. Because to have urban de development, the, the new activity or the new person that comes to that site must pay a higher rent for the land than the current one. So it, a gentrification is a, is, is, is a part that is very essential to urban development uh, in, in land markets. Uh, so, uh, of course, this puts into that side the pressure of displacement, but that is a tendency. Uh, very different is 
when uh, some scholars uh, tend to equate gentrification with displacement. For instance, uh, Kasgren and Janoska in a paper where they, they uh, on Santiago City and uh, where they make a, a critique to, uh, to our work. They say gentrification seems one of, of the most skill, skills, skillful and combative terms to analyze the structural mechanism that produce socio-spatial exclusion in the neoliberal city. We can affirm that gentrification has always been synonymous with two aspects, direct expulsion and indirect, indirect displacement. And finally, they say, consequentially, it is not a short-term displacement of the population settled in a specific territory, but rather the increasingly exclusive and irreversible reconversion of a neighborhood. And I think more with, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, for instance, the work of Henri Lefebvre and the work of Jane Jacobs uh, point to another type of a, a more dynamic and not a completely determined outcome of these processes. Uh, both of them think of urban development as kind of a contradictory processes of Lefebvre centralysis and segregation. Jacobs of areas that become popular and the cell destruction of diversity fueled by competition for space. So our point is, is very simple and in, in, in some sense empirical. We are witnessing parts of our cities, for instance, many locations in the traditional uh, low-income segregated periphery, uh, we are witnessing the arrival of these condominiums for, for medium and upper classes, and there is not taking place displacement in a, in a massive form. Uh, perhaps we can uh, afterwards uh, speak about uh, why is not displacing taking place there, when it, it seems to be loss of the, of the market economy that this displacement will take place. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. And I'm sure you'll give us examples of that from the Latin American context when we come back to you in a couple more minutes. So I wanna go from Chile to uh, Colombia and Juan Felipe. Uh, you're deeply involved in academic uh, and uh, in academic debates, but as well as very concrete policy debates and, um, and, and policy implementation in Colombia. Um, especially in ways that um, Colombian cities in Bogota in particular are directing their planning tools to address uh, potential gent uh, gentrification. And you, all, you very often frame your work in terms of conflict. And Pancho's already kind of talked about is that we have cases where uh, you have uh, uh, gentrification and it's not causing displacement, but it certainly does create conflict. Can you talk a bit more about the Colombian context that is driving and kind of incentivizing local governments in Bogota in particular to use planning tools uh, to address or anticipate potential displacement? Thank you, Enrique, and thank you for the invitation and for, I'm delighted to be here and to give some insights of my experience on those issues in Bogota. Then to answer your question first, I think it's important to, to, to point that recently, at least in Bogota and also in Medellin, but I'm I'm going to be focused on Bogota. The answers to, to displacement as a result for urban renewal projects has been in the center of planning policies. How from planning, trying to avoid that result. And in the processes of modifying the planning instruments of the city, basically the master plan, it has been introduced a whole new bunch of tools trying to avoid that result of the urban renewal project, which is 
there were development areas that are, that are defined by those that, by that instrument. But also in the political debates on, on Bogota, it's a central issue. We are now on a, on a campaign. We have local elections on Sunday. And in that election, in that uh, political debate, that concern is it's uh, gaining more and more interest and more debate. And as uh, Enrique mentioned, it has been really uh, eclipsed by conflict and conflict that sometimes is it seen that something that has to be avoided or managed. What we have learned in recent experiences in Bogota is that maybe conflict is something that we have to take advantage of in terms of the kind of pro, pro, uh, processes and outcomes that it may produce. Regarding that, uh, that conflict, especially in Bogota, is it's represented by, uh, can you move now? There, perfect. That that is, you, you, you see uh, in the image is a very famous case called Manzana Cinco, block number five in the center of Bogota, which was an initiative back in 2006, uh, driven by the local administration to do that, to, to make a big cultural uh, center in that area. And it was uh, the land management instrument that uh, drive that process was expropriation. Everyone from that block was expropriated from, from the place. And even though it was, a, I mean, a, a very polemic uh, situation, there was little or no forms of civil resistance against that project. There was a lack of mobilization. But when a neighbor Project, process and, and project begin 2009, 2010, it was seen as a situation in which that model of intervention may be reproduced. Then the neighbor, uh, can you move? The neighbor, the neighbor initiative, which is, which is that one, also was in the middle of the conflict because it's it's only it's only separated from that area one one one, one street. Then that that uh, project had 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 to deal with the effect of the late effects that that. Uh, intervention cost. The people who live there said we cannot face one Manzana Cinco, one Block Five again. <laughs> then there was a big mobilization against that that new initiative that was promoted by a private university, uh, Universidad de los Andes, and that conflict that was very very hard and it was a mobilization against the project produced produce a very interesting case of how to manage conflict and how to produce innovative perspectives on, on the uh, manage of urban renewal uh, processes. First, and in the center of the alternative that that project offers is how to remain in the area moving into the area, which is a land readjustment process, is how to re redevelop a nine block area, having the chance for the people who live there to remain in the area, but not in the precise plot where they live or they own land uh, exactly. It was then a new way of seeing the distributions of burden and benefits within an urban renewal project. 
at the end, that project, which is still under, under development, produce new regulation, not only for the project, but for the city. And I will be, I will get in into details uh, later on with my uh, reflections. But just to, to wrap up, what I would like to say is the conflict that Bogota has been facing has produced responses that turn the issue of land and management of land in the center of the responses to deal with displacement. Thank you, Juan Felipe. Great segue to um, Ana Claudia. And can we continue from your perspective and your work in, in Brazil? Can you give us a snapshot of the political and social dynamics that have also put the concern for displacement into the um, into city debates and the application of tools? And specifically, can you, um, you know, in, in Brazil, the, the, the um, embrace and both legal embrace and political embrace of the concept of social function of land, what might be the link between that concept and some of the tools um, and approaches that we're seeing there? Okay, so yeah, hi everybody. It's very nice to be here. Um, snapshot is very overrated, but I will try my best. So first I would like to call attention to two uh, facts and then in combination with two social forces, okay? So the two facts in terms of context for you to understand what happened in Brazil is that uh, in the early 60s, we had around 30 million people living in cities in Brazil. And then in 1990, we had more than 100, 110. So meaning 80 million people moved from rural areas from the north part of the countries to the more urbanized areas, 80 million people. That means more or less maybe 20 million households, we can discuss that, right? Uh, so this is one fact. Uh, in combination to this fact, our uh, housing policy generated in the same period about 4 million houses. So talking about 20 million new household needs and a production of 4 million where the lowest income segments were excluded. So basically, we built cities for and generated houses for the middle class, gentrifying older spaces, older neighborhoods uh, that were uh, demolished, older houses demolished. These houses were built like the houses, the house where my parents live, where I grew up. It's a high rise in the middle of the city and it was funded by public money with lots of subsidies and people were displaced by that. More people came because they wanted the jobs and they didn't have a place to live. So where did they move in? To places that we call favelas, informal settlements, precarious settlements, etc. right? So even until today, we have a very high prevalence of these settlements in, uh, not only in Brazil, but everywhere in Latin America, right? Uh, so this is one important fact. So this all happened uh, at the same time where we had a military dictatorship in Brazil that started in the 60s and ended by the end of the 80s. Okay, so these are the two contextual facts. And then we had two political, uh, two social forces that I want to highlight, and I'm not a sociologist, please forgive me in anticipation. I only name myself a social economist, but I'm not a social a scientist. Um, so the two forces are one, one technical movement that started around professionals, architects, engineers. They saw this happening and they thought we need to do something, right? And what was the something? The something what was what they called the urban reform. So the urban reform was first discussed at a technical level by professionals by architects, by uh, engineers, even before the military dictatorship, okay? Then the dictatorship came. So a second force, social force uh, emerged. And this was more grassroots bottom up and pretty much influenced by these professionals. They started to discuss the urban reform and the social function of the land. Understanding that the cities should benefit, you know, a bigger, uh, bigger 
piece or a larger piece of the society and not only uh, you know, a small cluster of people. So uh, this movement, a uh, large scale movement of the urban reform was pretty much born uh, in the favelas of the city. I come from Sao Paulo, where I was born and I, my professional development life. And uh, it was pretty much, it was funded also by, by the church, um, you know, uh, people like uh, Pope Francis, we had plenty of those living in, in, and working in, in favelas of Sao Paulo. And uh, what the work that they did was to educate people around human rights, right? So the movement, movement of urban reform and the idea and the concept of the social function of land was pretty much connected to a human rights struggle against the military dictatorship and uh, requesting access to basic services. So people wanted to have light. People wanted to have water, the minimum in their areas. And they reclaimed that and they said, okay, we live here, this is informal, we don't know who owns that, maybe it's public land, maybe it's private land, maybe we know, but we are here. This is the place that we found to live and we have right to access the basic services as everybody else in the city, right? So these two movements, they happened on a parallel basis. So you had a group of professionals, you have the grassroots, Pope Francis's, all these people, uh, and the favelas movements in Sao Paulo uh, became uh, a larger movement in the country. So this is a picture of uh, one of these large movements, uh, União dos Moradores uh, Popular uh, de Moradia, and uh, they are everywhere in Brazil. And they don't work only in favela territories anymore, but they advocate for the right to housing to everybody, right? And especially those with lower income, um, uh, with lower income. So uh, this, all these groups of people, they influenced uh, in our first democratic constitution after the dictatorship in 88, uh, they, 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 they pushed and they advocated for an urban chapter in this constitution, okay? So Brazil has an urban chapter. We didn't have the right of housing in the first version of the constitution, it came later on, but we have this urban chapter. And it says there is in Brazil, we have the, so, the recognition, the legal recognition of the social function of the land, the property and the city. And this was um, later on recognized in 2001 through a national law called the city statute. And I will explain in, later on, which are the instruments from the city statute that can help us to minimize the damage today. Oh, the anticipation. Good. We're, we're there. Hopefully, <laughs> we're keeping you in. Uh, we'll give you the example. So now, what I want, what I wanted to do is go and ask, um, go back to uh, Francisco and ask you, Francisco, uh, can you give us some examples uh, that you worked on that you've studied um, that demonstrate or that back up your argument that you can have gentrification without displacement and um, and and also kind of help us understand or kind of visualize what this looks like, um, at least from the Chilean context, which you you know quite well. Okay, thank you. Um, I can speak briefly of a, of a study we conducted in Santiago in the, the metropolitan area, where we um, identify areas under gentrification due to 406 uh, condominium projects. And these areas were areas that according to census data uh, were low income areas. And condominiums were for middle and upper uh, income people. Uh, and we found in them, in the way we ran a, a survey with a, with a sample of uh, 1,500 uh, uh, residents, old and the new ones, the gentrified and the gentrifiers. And we found that a surprising 44% of the buyers, the gentrifying households, live in the same municipality than their in-laws or parents. And this uh, figure goes up to 56% in 
when we consider uh, two parent families with young children. So this is a, a kind of a sociological phenomenon that we should uh, take into account. And it's a very far away of the idea of gentrification as equivalent to displacement. And uh, I think that that uh, peculiar type of uh, uh, investment of uh, development where uh, real estate agents kind of fabricate inequalities in a given locality in order to fabricate the rent gap uh, opens important opportunities uh, for public policy and particularly for uh, inclusionary housing policies. And uh, what I think it happens, why, why do we have this kind of, uh, of uh, development of gentrification uh, without displacement? Uh, there are some, I quickly will mention four uh, points here. Uh, residents, original residents are not renters, but owners of their houses, especially in the urban periphery. Second, there's vacant or reusable land to build new condos, especially in the urban periphery. And two other factors are more kind of uh, sociological or economic. There's not severe social divide in the lower part of the social scale in, scale in Latin America as compared to the US. We in Latin America have extreme wealth, more than extreme poverty. So, uh, when you in 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 this uh, uh, places that are being gentrified, the the gentrification projects put side by side uh, medium, lower medium people with low income people, and there's not a, a big break among them. And the other is more cultural, the mestizo culture, that uh, makes feasible social mixing uh, even in affluent districts. There are some uh, research uh, that back these ideas. That's why I would explain why we have, we can have gentrification without displacement, with conflict, with tendencies to displace, but with not actual displacement. And why we have this peculiarity of the endemic gentrification. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pancha. Um, again, a great, provide a great segue back to Juan Felipe and the uh, case in Bogota, thinking about the, the fabrication of inequality and what opportunities that provides. So can we go back and um, learn a bit more about what's going on and again, specifically what the planning tools are that um, are being um, deployed? Thank you, Enrique. Well, what I would like to point is that that progressive policy that has been result of that conflict in Bogota is now under discussion. It was included in the, in the master plan back in 2021. But nowadays is under discussion the particular regulation of implementing that uh, policy. But there are, I mean, it, have, it hasn't been approved yet, but it's going to be before the actual mayor leaves office at the end of this year. And there we have like many innovations, but Based, some of them based in the, in the example that I gave you of the financial process. 
first, for example, it, it's going to be mandatory in those areas of urban renewal to do in advance socioeconomic census of the population living in those areas. That to identify the beneficiaries of the different means that are going to be uh, put in place. Also, there will be, there is a, there is incentive, incentives for using land readjustment as a, as a mean for assembling, assembling the land in those uh, projects. Trying to, trying to force even owners not to sell their land, but to participate, contribute, contributing their land uh, in exchange of replacement units within the project. So, this idea. Also, for example, freezing the stratification, which is the system that it's used in Colombia to define the cost of the public facilities, then those areas in which uh, urban renewal processes, processes are taking place. And for those who participate in the projects, they will have that incentive that at the end, when they receive replacement units, those units will have a freezing period of time of the public uh, utilities. Those are two examples. Another example is the creation of a special governance instances for not only designing, but also the debating and uh, getting uh, agreements and also in the implementing phases. At the end, what, I, what it, all this represents from my point of view is a redistribution mean, not only in terms of how to use land value increments, because at the end, what you see there is that those increments cost that what we, what we could call the gentrification interest on those areas, it's gonna be used in particular means for producing protection for weak population within the areas. Of course, this is going, this is, this is being on their dispute and uh, controversy. The developers and the real estate agents are debating that regulation. They don't really like the, what they call, uh, what they call uh, costs, transactional costs within those processes. But what we can see so far in this process is that even though the, the, the regulation is producing progressive uh, means for landowners is not that powerful with tenants. Tenants remain being weak population within those processes. There are some, some uh, definitions to give some power to them to, to, to approve the, the, the projects and so on. But at the end, they are not as powerful as landowners within those areas. Thank you so much, Juan Felipe. So we can see some progress in some levels, but still there is a segment of the population there that uh, remains vulnerable. Let's go back to Brazil anticipating to hear what the social function of land has triggered and unleashed. Um, Ana Claudia, um, some examples from Brazil. So first, the end of the story that I was telling was positive because the people won. Uh, now in Brazil, we have large access to water and electricity in even in the formal settlements. Uh, so in our constitution, we ended up having um, two major uh, aspects in terms of urban. One is uh, the leadership and protagonism of cities. And the second is the social function, which says every family 
living in a in an urban as an urban lot until 250 square meters i wouldn't know how to say that um, in other measurement um, for five years without complaining has the right to stay there so this is on the constitution so these people here living in a disinformal settlement in the city of São Bernardo, which belongs to the metropolitan area of São Paulo, uh, they don't have or they didn't have, you know, formal um, uh, property register. Uh, they were informally settled there. But because our constitution has this provision, and later on we have this law called the city statute, this area was earmarked as so as social interest uh, area or zoning for social interest or special social interest. So we have this mechanism in, in our Brazilian law. So cities can identify areas that are occupied informally, earmark them, so people would have the right, you know, to have infrastructure services and so on. And this picture shows a program that was uh, large scale funded by the national government. It was linked to a, uh, a, a national growth accelerate, economic growth acceleration program. We survived the international crisis of 2008 because of this program, because people had jobs. So we had full employment um, in Brazil at that time. And uh, which were the risks in terms of gentrification and displacement? Some of these areas are well located like in Rio de Janeiro, on the hills, you probably saw pictures, right? So there was a fear that these areas would be gentrified. So there are, in, 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 in some slums today, you know, a certain level of gentrification, I would say that, especially the ones best located. But the major tool that this zoning process gives us is a limitation for producing market houses. And it's up to cities, to municipalities to determine how much and what's the income, right? So if 60% or 70% or 50% or 40% market houses are allowed. So there's this provision at the city level, it is only possible because of the national law. So this is one very important um, uh, planning instrument that we have. We can also use this instrument for underutilized and vacant areas in city to provide more spaces and more places for social housing. We don't use that much because it's very difficult to earmark this as because everybody wants to have the well-located, empty and underutilized building. Some of cities, some cities has, have managed to have that. But um, I was just imagining if we could have larger spaces in cities earmarked because that will really protect us from the sort of gentrification that Pancho was talking about that we still experience in the kind of low middle income neighborhood in cities that are being affected by real estate development. And I'm talking about formal areas now. So uh, luckily for these people living here and bad for us, bad for everybody, actually bad for them, but um, in a way we have a huge gap in Brazil and in Latin America between income groups. So uh, many of these areas are located in areas where people, rich people, middle class people, wouldn't like to live, right? Uh, because they're very, very different than the other spaces. Uh, and this is structural gap. It kind of, I think, protect these areas, many of these areas of gentrification so far. I don't know how it will be um, in the future. And then to finalize, a second tool that we developed at national level was related to the sports events that we had in, in last uh, decade in Brazil, we had one, Olympic event and one uh, soccer World Cup. And we had the risk of people being displaced because of the infrastructure works. So the national government decided to set up a safeguards um, regulation. Uh, so each project infrastructure, infrastructure project that would generate displacement would have to prove, you know, that this is really the last resort, technically. Uh, and this, I think, prevented many people of being displaced and evicted during uh, this event, although I think many were, but it prevented and minimized uh, the displacements and evictions. And these two are national laws. And I was wondering in the debate this morning about, you know, the U.S. and other countries that are federal countries, you know, what would be the role of national laws? We still depend a lot of local governments 
to change things. But in the case of Brazil, having the national provision was essential for cities to have real instruments and be, you know, validated in, in, in designing uh, local policies. Thank you so much. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. If we can maybe take one or two questions, if there's interest, get at least one. Hello, uh, my name is Stefano. I'm a PhD student at University of Leicester. And my question is to, to Ana Claudia, because I also studied uh, gentrification in, in Sao Paulo. And I was thinking about your what you said about uh, gentrification might be happening in favelas, or especially in the ones that are better localized. And I completely agree. But during my research, I've noted lots and lots of resistance towards uh, affirmations like this one, and especially gentrification in, in favelas. Uh, do you think that these resistances uh, are still happening, uh, not only in Brazil, uh, towards the use of gentrification? Sometimes I think it's hard for Latin Americans and Brazilian uh, scholars to accept gentrification because there is an idea of uh, gentrification as an attempt at colonization from the northern agenda or something like that. And if yes, uh, if do you think that uh, it, it makes uh, Latin American Brazilian cities more vulnerable to, to gentrification, especially in, in favelas? Stefano. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a social scientist. I really, I really don't know. I will not risk. But I think gentrification is at risk in Brazilian cities until we solve, we are able to solve our inequalities. If we don't solve that, we'll be prone to gentrification and that's it. We can minimize with uh, zoning and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, the risk will be there. But I, this is where bringing back what Francisco was saying is that there's what's coming out of their research and observations of, in the cities is that you're getting the so if gentrification is tied to levels of incomes, you're not it's not the hyper wealthy upper classes that are coming in. It's it's within the low middle to lower tranches of the income ladder and that still have the dynamics could still happen there. Um, and the question is that in some cases they're not now, could they? But that mixing, and so it really, it is a fascinating to see. It's, um, it's not the, the, the capital, the, the, the level is not the highest end, but it is a higher end than those places that are being transformed. Um, and does that happen? And that's not a colonial, that's, that's as, as, as Pancho was saying, it's endemic, it's within itself, it's its own community. Um, there's one more question, and then I just wanted to do a wrap up to let you know why we're so interested in the work that's coming out of Latin America. Yeah, I, hello? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a question to Francisco. Mm -hmm. um, I, I basically follow his work for, for a very long time because I study gentrification without displacement in Lima, which is a Latin American trend, but I, I do think that. Santiago is very paradigmatic. There's a lot of academics that have well-developed conceptualizations about what's going on and the prominent role of the real estate actor in this phenomenon because gentrification without displacement happens because there's high density building. It cannot happen in another way because I mean, if you don't densify a city, people will have to be displaced. So I think uh, what I want to say is that I was developing this work that was basically focused on how the construction process affects low density housing. It affects them in numerous ways that it makes them really suffer because the construction process is quite intensive. You build 30 floors and then six like uh, underground parking spaces is, is, is horrendous. And what I saw when I was reviewing the literature specific on that, is that there, there's a lack of focus on this kind of aspects. Like there's a lot to say about symbolic displacement because there is no residential displacement. They're symbolic because people feel not at ease in their neighborhoods anymore for a num number of reasons. But the, what I notice is that no one really talks about 
how invasive is the construction process itself. And I think that can be viewed under a gentrification lens as well. We were given the one minute thing. So a bunch of half a 30 seconds and then I'll let everyone go to the next panel. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, we have a, a gentrification in the urban peripheries with the building of houses, not only buildings. And we have uh, gentrification without displacement and endemic gentrification in those type of projects also. The other thing is was with, with the walls and fences, not all, but many of these uh, condos gentrif gentrifying the peripheries, their doors are open, uh, their guards are not there. And so it's a matter of uh, research to know what are the relationships between the gentrifiers and the gentrified. And uh, we can find a lot of things. Of course, there is there's a conflict. Uh, there is also taking place uh, some sort of displacement. Perhaps the, the, the most negative part of this is that land prices would, will uh, go up with the new projects in the, in the, in the low-income periphery. So there's no more land for social housing, for instance. And that's, from my viewpoint, the reason why we are having a, 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 a crisis in a, in a, with housing, with a, with a informal settlement in Chile, back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pancho. Just quickly, one of the reasons, hopefully this illustrates the reasons the Institute has been so invested in research and work out of Latin America is this, it's a region that provides us a very beautiful broad lens into the relationship between conflict, reform, in particular reform of our land and land policy. Um, and, and in this case, cases where the conflicts go to such a scale that the state decides to intervene in the land markets. And, the, and just kind of pick up, and that's a question that I think was something that maybe it'll come up in other conversations. Why intervene in the land market, in the property markets? How do you do it? At what level? Um, and, and then again, it's part of what Francisco was saying. We're also very keen in trying to understand the possible um, unintended consequences of interventions like the, the zones that uh, that uh, that Ana Claudia was talking about, when you take land, when you freeze a zone in anticipation, what are you doing to all of those zones outside of that? And is that counter-effective to the um, to what well Pancho was saying to accessible uh, economically accessible uh, pieces of land for the housing that's needed? And is our housing crisis then perversely? triggered by that. So that's the work of the Institute. If you're interested in those aspects, among others, please come and visit us. We're just on the other side of this little waterway over here. So thank you so much. Thank you.